see if it works. Not now. All right, let me look at my phone to see if we're working. Oh, I should turn the volume off. Otherwise, we'll be talking to ourselves without doing anything. And that, no fun, Tom. No fun. All right. No, wait, wait. No, I want to, I want to pin the post. Yep. What? No, I don't want to report myself. You know, sometimes Facebook has some questions that I'm not sure about. Do you want to report this video? No, I don't want to report myself. I just want to make it an announcement. Yeah. Do, do, do. All righty. So I think I can see people popping in. All right. So um, those of you in Facebook land or YouTube, you can use those comments. Um, if you're, if you, if you have the link to the Zoom, you can always just come over to the Zoom, because then Tom can see your questions. <laughs> if you're typing, I uh, if you want to talk talk junk about Tom though, then you just do it on Facebook and YouTube, uh, because he can't see those as we're doing this. Um, but all of you that are on um, Zoom, you can use the Q and A fact section. For Q and A, like if you have questions, you can use the chat thing. Y'all can all talk to each other. Now, I've had this experience before. Some people don't like the chat, which is fine. Just don't look at it. Like I know it's real tempting. People have message. You're like, well, there's so many things in the chat. I can't follow it all and follow what y'all are talking about, and that's okay. Just ignore the chat and lead it, read it later, or ignore us. Um, I don't know how to turn it off. For individuals um but yeah the there we go all right now let's see people are still popping on oh chat is disabled how's chat disabled this is see i can see chat is it disabled for everyone this is gonna annoy me every time zoom i hope you're monitoring this every time <laughs> they update something they uh, reset settings. All right. Tom, you tell them about the Center for Open Relational Theology and Northwind why <laughs> I see if Sounds I can good. change this because this is going to irritate me. And uh, this, everyone knows, I just finished moving. I've been, I haven't lived in a house for a month. No, for 29 days. And we're in here, a new house. There's serious problems. That we're trying to remedy so i'm in a room with boxes so uh I'm well actually frazzled. it's I'm frazzled, good you know? it's good timing for me because uh <laughs> i was in vancouver bc teaching at vancouver school of theology last week a course uh, i call something like an open god and an open universe or something like that anyway i was reminded that it was three years prior to that when i was also teaching at vancouver school of theology that uh, I officially announced the launch of the Center for Open and Relational Theology. So this is like the third anniversary. We're only three years old. And then a year later or so, uh, launched the uh, doctoral program in Open and Relational Thought, which is uh, at, it's actually co-sponsored by Northwind Theological Seminary and the Center for Open and Relational Theology. And what's cool about that program is obviously, in addition to exploring open and relational theology, I get to work one on one with uh, students in the program. So like unlike most programs in which you take certain courses and you go through with a cohort and every class is timed out on you know certain dates, this is super flexible. I get to work one-on-one -on -one with people according to their schedule, according to the topics they like, every syllabus is unique, et cetera. So anyway, so it's been two years since that launched and I've already had just this last Friday, yeah, a few days ago, 
the first student just zipped through the doctoral program uh, and Jonathan Foster finished his, uh, or defended his dissertation, which is actually something you might be, Trip, you might look into uh, bringing Jonathan on the show because he's, he's bringing together Rene Girard's mimetic theory and open relational theology. Um, and it's pretty fascinating uh, dissertation. So are you up and running now? Or should, I, should I keep talking? Look, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Look, I can see I, this, did you see message. my te- did you see my message I can see your message yeah no they can't they, it still hmm. says disabled so I'm guessing uh it it won't let me change the settings Mer- panelists can chat with attendees can chat with Let's see all right now see if you can chat Oh, yes. there we go. Hey, hey. People <laughs> are trying to keep us down, Tom. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. this is not a determined chat. This is an open chat. Um, uh, so, Laura, um, yes, we left the creepy troll in the basement in Scotland. Um, uh, Andrew Schwartz, a former Tom Ward student, was one of the guests during the class. And uh, and somehow the discussion came up about this creepy troll I found in the basement at the house we were living in. And I, I showed it to everyone. Um, there are two versions of that video, by the way, in the class. I hadn't hit record yet. So y'all, if you're on live, you'll know this. Um, when I recorded those, there were like two versions of all of the um, chats because it had all, I sent the whole video to an uh, editor and um and he was like, I really think you should do the long version of this one for everyone because you and Andrew, by the time you were done, y'all are both a little uh, giggly and it's funny. And most theologians are boring. So you, you'll, you'll seem human. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I'm going to be in Charlotte next week with Ben Boswell, friend from undergrad, launching it's a book release party and Gerard O'Marty. I think is going to be there as well. Um, book release party for his uh, book confronting whiteness. Uh, it's on his, it's based on his doctorate work on dealing with um, uh, racism, uh, well, confronting whiteness within congregations. He works at a Baptist church in uh, Charlotte. It's going to be fun. All righty. We got everything on. So I'm going to hit record, Tom. So now we can. Sounds good. Uh, not freak out about whatever is going to happen. Record. Hello, everyone. This is Trip, and the one and only Thomas J. Ord is here. And we're going to be answering some questions sent in by the most amazing members of the Christianity in Process class that we are wrapping up. So um, we got a whole bunch of questions, Tom. And you and I, we've done a series for the last couple of years, every couple of months, called Big God Questions. And one of the things I've learned in doing this is that we only need about three questions for an hour and a half. (laughs) That's so true. (laughs) But so you know what else I've learned from those big God things is that after I'm done, I've laughed so much my face hurts from laughing. (laughs) So I'm already off to laughing. That's a good sign. I know. So I'm going to save them. And if we have ones we don't get to at all and stuff, Tom and I will pick them back up next time we do uh, big God questions. And uh, th- that way, that way we will uh, uh, have some fun. Uh, we, 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 we'll preserve the possibilities of conversation. Um, but thank you all for being here and sending tons of cool questions. So this is, it was, yeah. it's really hard. So what we decided is that Tom and I will take turns picking a question. And we pick the question the other one has to answer first. So it's that's why we don't know what, what's going to happen. We only know that we're going to pick the questions we think the other one should have to answer first. And then we can decide if we have something to add or not. Um, and uh, who knows? Who knows? Tom, do you have any? Um, no. You, we talked right before this started uh, on the podcast, recorded it first live podcast with another person in my room at asset before everyone. Yeah, that's right. 
how many people left that conference with COVID? I, we probably know at least a half a dozen just amongst I, our friends. Yeah, it was it was impressive, um, yeah. but uh, it was tons of fun. Real hug in real life with Tom Ward, and uh, and and now they've spent six weeks with John Cobb. Visit from Catherine Keller and Joe Bracken, Andrew Schwartz. It's Donna an impressive Bowman, lineup you've John got. Gill. I know it was it, it was tons of fun. So if if there are new figures or people you want to make reference to or resources, feel free to shout them out uh, during it. And if I remember them or people remind me, I'll make sure I put links. But um, because <clears throat> some of the questions and things maybe or it might be stuff we've talked about before or you you want to just point someone s- somewhere. So feel free to do that. But the first question in this one was sent in on audio, but my uh, adapter from playing audio on Zoom is somewhere between here in Scotland and it's been delayed and should be here between the end of August and the middle of October or September. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when my crate gets here. Uh, but it was Deborah. And Deborah said, um, I want to know what are the fundamentals of process? Like, are there like three to five things, not 10 or something? And I, she probably said it with a little m- more gusto there, but she's like, I don't want a big list, but like, who are like three to five things, you know, the tulip of team process? Uh, <laughs> like, w- w- what would you pick? See, now that you, once you explain this to me, Tom, then I start using it. Yeah. Going for it. It's a really tough question. That's because you and I both know that uh, John Cobb has zero fundamentals of process theology, and David Griffin has ten fundamentals. And there's, you know, <laughs> there are people all, all over the board in terms of how to define it. I saw somebody ask this question in the uh, Facebook chat as well, uh, and I was thinking, like, if I was on an elevator and I had twenty stories to pitch what process theology is, what would I say? And it's a tough thing. Um, so, but if, if I had to, I would pick five things. So one, I would say God and the world are always in process. In other words, moving forward through time Two, God and creation are always interrelated such that the world affects God and God affects the world. Three, something like panpsychism or pan experientialism, that there's an interiority to everything that exists top to bottom. Four, that there's a measure of self determination from top to bottom, something like freedom from the quarks to God. And finally, what was my fifth one? Oh, great. Oh, it was just sort of playing out various notions of God, like what God can know and God's influence and that sort of thing. Um, I won't go into details on that one, but we'll just call it uh, a, a, an open and relational, not omnipotent God. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? No, that's, that's really good. So, uh, all right. So basically that you had all mine. I was going to add oh, really? oh. Christianity and process is um, uh, that we, we don't cross our fingers when we say that what Jesus said didn't endure revealed the nature of God. Uh, and yeah. if we think of that ending passage in process and reality where Whitehead contrasts uh, the Galilean vision, uh, mm-hmm. power, love, and activity with God as moral ruler, God as principle of being, and God as uh, king, judge, that kind of stuff. Um, the, there was another question similar to this that was like, uh, what is reality? Something like that. Um, and, uh, and then what are the basics of process? And so uh, I thought of four shifts, I think, unless I come up with a fifth one by the time I get done, since you thought of five. And, and these would be the shifts that if you, if you do the boop, 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 switch operating systems from yeah. kind of substance style thinking to process, that when you do the shifts, then you're like, oh, I'm in the groove. I'm in the flow. Okay. Process. Let me guess what they're going to. Oh, oh, no. Well, no, I no. Guess. No, you no. got to prehend them. You know, guessing. <laughs> Being to becoming, probably one. Is that right? What? That's not how I put it. Okay. But... How'd you put it? No, no, Tom. I want to hear all of your guesses. <laughs> no, no, no. I interrupted you. I should have I was have done trying that. to answer the question short. <laughs> See, this is what happens. This is why Tom says we giggle a lot. Okay. Shift one is from substance to event. Okay, there you go. Okay. Yep. 
Uh, and, and, and that's the question of like, what is primary? Oh. The, the myth of a thing or the reality of an event, the flow, the becoming. Second is, uh, and this is connected to the panpsychism type thing you mentioned earlier, a shift from uh, the world as machine to the world as organism. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other is the, is, the, is the actual entity's relation to the world is a shift from an entity as inert to an, an, an entity as responsive. Okay. And then internal and external relations there. Yep. Yes. So you have both. You have both. Um, and then, uh, and then the ideal of any, uh, perfection is, is found in relation as opposed to found without it. And, wow, and, no. and, and I, and I see the ideal thing I think is important just because, and this is something Charles Hartshorn philosopher makes a big deal of is that so much of our natural thinking in the West is informed by this vision of what is perfect. Well, what's perfect power when you have all of it? What's perfect knowledge when you know the past, present, and the future completely? What's perfect, you know, these kinds of what is perfect is something where your relationships do not entail your perfection. And I think that shift to, to relationality, to connectedness, for understanding perfection is essential. And uh, anyway. The, so yeah, those that's are awesome. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone the perfection route, but I totally endorse it. So that's, yeah, wow. that's, that's good. <laughs> you can do some, uh, you know, put a, a grant together for analytic theology, uh, perfect being thing from a process perspective. The world needs that. That's, you know, then I'd have to hand, hang out with analytic theologians. <laughs> you could do it though, for the sake of green, you could do it, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like the of the grant. <laughs> Some people are like, so what does it cost to sell your soul? Well, that's one thing. But what does it cost for you to spend three years managing analytic theologians? Ooh. Does it does it pay off all my student loans and pay for my kids' college? Because then all of a sudden I love a syllogism. Oh yeah. Anyway, all right, Tom, you get to pick the next question. Okay, I was looking earlier today and Betty put a nice series of questions. I want to ask the last one because when I was teaching last week in Vancouver, this was a topic of discussion and I'd like to hear your thoughts. In process thought, in what sense, if any, is God personal? Oh, I mean, I think uh, pretty significantly. I mean, so much depends on what you mean entails and personal, right? But right, um, yeah. But uh, if you just think about how we use the word, right? Oh, you took that personally. Um, what usually is entailed in, did you take that personally or you took that personally is that what someone said or did or this experience wasn't something that just washed over you and you weren't changed by it, but something that impacted you, right? That, uh, that, that changed you, that, that shaped your moment. Your moment after it is different because you were, you know, it was a personal encounter. Um, and if you think of, uh, so there's one layer of personal. Another way of thinking about personal is personal experience is the highest form of experience that we know of in the cosmos. Now, we have our limited scale of our duration, our sense. So there may be bigger ones. Um, medieval people had bigger ones, angels and stuff. Anyway, you, you, but our, the highest form of complex experience we know is intimate personal experience. If you ask someone, like, what was the most important moments in their life? It's very rare that someone's going to be like, well, it was, uh, insert um, some fact that happened elsewhere. It's going to be holding your child, falling in love, betraying someone and being uh, forgiven, um, succeeding at something you put all this effort in, a dramatic terror. Or like they're going to be personal things. And so, yeah. one of the things about uh, a, a process vision is that God is uh, uh, Phil Clayton, who hadn't been on the podcast, but he'll be on the next week. He says that God's no less than personal in to say something that ultimate reality should express nothing less than the most rich expression of the universe. So is that now in Whitehead uh, as part it, it, towards the end of process and reality is a bit in part two or part three. I don't remember because I don't have the book with me yet. Uh, it's being shipped. But uh, he talks about he spends all this time talking about the primordial nature of God. So how God comes to each moment 
uh, giving the lure of possibility, aims, these kinds of things, right? And so God's values, the eternal forms, these kinds of things are contextualized to like, what does beauty, truth, goodness, adventure, zest look like in the next moment? But, and he spends less time on this, but this is what I think is important for personal, uh, question of personal God, is that God not only gives possibility, but then receives what happens into God. He says that uh, God re judges all things, right? Like how, what became, how does it compare to the deepest desires for beauty and goodness and truth? And then God redeems it and it comes part of the divine life. And it's because of that internal personal knowing in the divine life that the next moment, the lure or the call of God uh, becomes contextualized. And it's that the, the both shifts, those two poles, the primordial and the consequent, if you're using process language. So in some sense, um, when God is personal because all of the world is being taken up and yeah. judged and redeemed by God in each moment. And the way God is present to each creature is shaped by God's intimate internal knowledge of it. And so, uh, yeah, anyway. I, I, you know, when I think about this question, it's interesting. You went to Whitehead. I would have gone to Hartshorn. I think Charles Hartshorn offers a conceptual framework that better frames a personal God, a relational God, what, the way you did it works, but that consequent nature in Whitehead, because Whitehead thinks of God as one entity ever concressing, it doesn't fit so nicely as when Charles Hartshorn comes along and says, no, God's this, this uh, everlasting succession of divine experiences, giving and receiving moment by moment. That, to me, better conceptualizes the consequent nature. I wish Whitehead should have learned from his pupil there, <laughs> I think. But I, I prefer that Hartshornian approach to that when it comes to the, the personal side. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so a couple of people asked for reading recommendations. So I'm like, if people haven't read Charles Hartshorn before, uh, who's in the right book, a lot easier to read than most of Whitehead, um, where would yeah. you point them? Boy, good question. Um, hmm. You know, he tried, he tried to be accessible as possible in omnipotence and other theological mistakes. So my, my gut is to go that direction, but he's not as accessible as I wish he would be. Um, maybe, oh, what's that little book? Oh, I've got it behind me here. Um, oh, The Divine Relativity. I yeah, like The yeah. Divine Relativity a lot. That's, I, and it's, it's very really short and yeah it's yeah i i like divine relativity there's a number of he has a number of short articles um that i've collected like when i teach it at a graduate level i have this drop box that i have <laughs> all the different like my favorite five articles from a bunch of process thinkers nice and um uh, he wrote this uh encyclopedia entry for some journal on like whitehead's concept of god and it was I read it and I was like, wow, that was a, that saved a lot of time. Anyway, <laughs> the, okay. So I get to pick the next question and Tom okay. has to answer this first. Ooh. So this would be fun. Oh, wait, well, here's a good one because you might be the most networked uh, member of the process community. Cindy asked, <laughs> I'd appreciate hint hearing about process theology and other religions like process Judaism, Islam, and others. Mm. Um, I, one, this is a great question. Obviously, this class was Christianity and process, which kept it. Uh, the only thing I, I, I'd say just that there's tons here, and Tom has a list. If you go on Homebrew and just type in Rabbi Artson, you'll hear you can go check out a number of times he and I've talked, and um, I, he's in my top five, you know, process yeah, he's theologians. awesome, so awesome guy. Yeah, there's an audio resource, but Tom. All right. Process well, you know, theology. another another Jewish thinker who uh, I would recommend is Shai Held, S-H-A-I-H-E-L-D. Uh, but there's other uh, Jewish thinkers in the process community. Um, you know, maybe I should I can announce something right here. I haven't even talked to you about this trip. The first uh -oh. week of December, um, I'm going to co-host a online, fully online conference with uh, Muslim and Christians who are open and relational. 
It's going to be two days. It's uh, co-sponsored by, oh, great, a university in Germany. Name escapes me. Manuel Schmidt has been working with me uh, as well as some others. Anyway, so there's Muslim uh, process thinkers. There's Baha'i. Uh, there's Hindu. Um, and if, if you count, I don't know where you put Mormons. I put them in Christianity, but they're Mormon process thinkers. Uh, there's a lot of folks who don't really want to identify with any particular religious tradition, but are open, relational, and process. Others who want to identify with multiple. So like our good friend Jay McDaniel oftentimes calls himself a Buddhist Christian. Um, and, you know, well, what what else have I missed, Trip? I've, those are sort of the main religious traditions. You know any yeah. Rastafarian process, folks? I, I don't know, but it would work. I mean, I it went was. to Claremont. <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah in the uh uh w when i visited claremont um in for those of you who don't know that claremont is cl in california sitting in california it's also the, the most progressive united methodist uh seminary but lots of the mainline denominations go there um but when i was first there for center for process studies summer school um i and i was from north carolina baptist preachers kid first time i, I was just into reading it and when I realized that at the divinity school dorms, there were people growing weed on the balcony, I was like, you are not in the South anymore. <laughs> I was like, what is that? <laughs> I had a similar thing coming to Claremont, but for me, it was seeing condoms in the men's restroom. They didn't have that in my seminary, in my holiness <laughs> seminary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the 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 other thing about uh, is, and John mentioned this quite a bit about um, the uh, the way process has taken off in China, which mm. is a you know largely shaped by Confucianism. Which there's debates in religious studies as to whether or not that counts as a religious yeah. tradition. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, um, the 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 other thing I would say is um this is one of those points where it might it's just good to say most big philosophies like if, if you're trying to give a big account of the world it's going to be engaging in uh, all the different sciences and and thinking through history and yeah. these kinds of things and thinking about phenomenological experience of the world and being human, like all these kinds of things you have to give this rich account and most good philosophies um become tools for people that participate in each religion or multiple right at this point in history so right there are platonist theologians of multiple religious traditions and there are platonists who part let's say christian ones where they're like oh they're too platonist they're not christian enough and yeah. then there are ones that change enough platonism that then they're like as orthodox as it gets and then they invent orthodoxy so they, they uh, when you think of process theologians, they're theologians who think the process philosophical vision uh, is helpful in articulating reality, the world and God and how things happen. Uh, and, and then each religious tradition has particular things they wrestle with, questions that you ask and struggle with, stories and narratives that you wrestle with, and these kinds of things. So, um, you know, we for, I forgot to, to mention one of the most important, and that's the Buddhist tradition. I mean, uh, most Buddhism comes in various forms, but uh, some of the most dominant forms fit nicely with a process notion of be, becoming. And um, yeah. if it's, uh, would, would you agree with this trip? Would you agree that amongst those who are self-identifying process thinkers, there are more Christians than any other tradition? Because it seems that's the case. My experience has been there's more Christians. There are more process people who identify as Christian than any other religion. Is that true for you? I, mean, yours? I, I think so. But I would say in, in the continent, in Europe, uh, they're more likely to be Catholic. In the United States, they're more likely to be Methodist. <laughs> Yeah, and the yeah. Holiness or tradition. Protestant at least. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, yeah. Um, and but considering the numbers in China and things, I don't I don't have a good way of uh, good point, yeah. you know, of gauging it. But in the West, I would think the the like the conversation of, of Islam and process is relatively due. Right, um, right. The that Rabbi Artson runs the biggest rabbinical school on the West Coast 
and he's like, this isn't surprising. <laughs> this, <laughs> he found process philosophy and was like, oh, you mean like good Jewish theology? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I think it, it becomes more controversial so that you identify with it in Christianity because, um, well, Calvinism is yeah. horrible and it's, I don't know, <laughs> anyway, sorry, that was snarky. That was snarky. Sorry, I didn't want to. All right, is it my um, turn to ask yeah, you now? Yeah, you have to pick. You have to pick. Okay, another one that I like because I get it a lot, so I want to hear yours. Maureen asks, I resonate with the idea of the lure when it's applied to people, but I'm asking how cancer cells, for example, can be lured. If cancer cells can sometimes be lured in a way that leads to a cure, well, why can do, or does God do, does, well, why doesn't God do it more often? I think is what she's asking. So yeah. luring cancer cells trip, how did, what's going on there? Well, I th well see there's, I guess there's like a few parts of this one. Well, so one thing is there were some other questions about the lure, uh, the lure oh, was there. Okay. Um, is, is not coercive. It's non-competitive in a sense, um, but it's the gift of possibilities that are valued. Then there's the horizon of reception that every actual entity has um, yours and mine as humans tends to be higher. It also varies. Uh, I always think of the, um, those really funny uh, uh, Snickers commercials where, you know, the hangry ones where all of a sudden someone has a Snicker bar and it's like, it went from being like a football player beating people up to a grandma knitting or whatnot. Um, and there's a funny way of getting it our awareness of the world, the way we are engaging in it can so be shaped by a stomach flu and irritation or, or all sorts of things, right? Like, so um, it's not like our moment to moment, there's some pure reception of the lure and possibilities and enactment. Uh, that's also sidestep a good reason to cultivate uh, habits of mindfulness, attentiveness, gratitude, and graciousness. Um, but uh, so that you become a different person showing up in the next moment. Um, but once you recognize that there is both how uh, a kind of a spectrum of possibility of depth of what is being able to be received by each creature or each entity and um, each entity, what is inheriting uh, shapes its attitude or presence in the next moment. Then you ask the question of cancer. Uh, like part of what are the problem of cancer is its inability to differentiate uh, boundaries between other entities. Like that's what drives cancer. It, it, it doesn't have a, a sticking boundary. And so what does it do? It grows excessively in ways that undo the health to the whole system it's in. Now we could say, I don't know, maybe human beings might be a cancer on the planet and this is creating ecological <laughs> problems. But like you see, like there, there is a ideal in the sense of, of harmony of relations and part of the identity in a sense of cancer or cells that, that, that relate to the world without conscious committed relation to the whole. Um, and uh, it's on my YouTube channel, I have this uh, lecture, Edwin Freeman, Jewish process uh, pastoral therapist guy did, and he uses the cancer imagery uh, quite well in thinking about helpful differentiation and stuff. But um, this is one of the predicaments of cancer uh, as is uh, its receptivity, right? It is not a complex entity. It is very simple. It grows. It actually responds very similar to viruses. The problem is it grows uh, successfully in environments that are ultimately destruction, destructive to the host. So um, uh, like, if you think through all the nuances of, of God's relationship to entities and its relations, uh, cancer is one of the more perverse forms, destructive forms of an entity in relation. Um, it, it's helpful in drawing analogy to unhelpful members or participants and other things. Uh, so I think that means that there are limits to anything. God doesn't control anything. God's present to calling. Um, and, and so the, the idea of, of like God luring some cancer to disappear and others not, I think misses the, uh, misses the notion of God's power. I would say something like God is always doing all God can do. Um, yeah. in every moment for the good of creation and that we are connected 
to all of creation in ways we don't always recognize. And so um, if you think of questions around prayer and all these kinds of things, um, exactly uh, like how do we contribute and participate to all the entities we're created, uh, connected to um, is a live question. Um, I like but- that. I, I want to emphasize two things you said, because I thought they were really important. One is God is doing all God can do. I remember getting in a debate with someone one time about that. And they said, oh, that process, God, is just, you know, just, just only doing as the best God can do in any particular moment. And I thought, well, the alternative is God isn't doing the best God can do. So like, <laughs> I'll take God doing the best God can do than God sitting yeah. on the sidelines twiddling thumbs. <laughs> and the second thing you said that I think is really important is the limits that anything has in its responsiveness to God. Humans are far more complex than cells. Cells make up humans, but we have much broader range of responsiveness and we can rebel or not. But, um, you know, we all know even humans are super limited. Tonight is the, um, the all-star baseball game. And I can't both pitch for the American League and field questions here. So I chose this. Uh, there's lots of things I can't do because I'm limited. And cells are limited even more so. So the influence God has on them is important, but it's not like a wide ranging sort of number of options. And um, cancerous cells can respond well or poorly to God, but they're also influenced by their other environments and and what's going on, as you mentioned. So, yeah, I'm just echoing you. I'm not saying anything new. Sorry. (laughs) But the, uh, um, I think there is a sense that, that God, in some in some ways, uh, orchestrates co- cooperation uh, sure. with a host. So one example I think is as a minister, when I go into a uh, home of someone in the middle of cancer treatment and such, and you're praying, I'm not praying thinking that if I did a good job, um, God's gonna be like, oh. You convinced well, me. <laughs> I've decided. <laughs> Mommy doesn't need a doctor. You know, like that's not how it is. Yeah. But there, I do recognize that there is a whole community connected to this person. And there are tons of relationships in which God can be present in unique and personal and intimate mm-hmm. ways that would transform the whole. So you can pray for the individual. Because what do you know in a process vision? God knows them completely, loves them completely, is present to them. Their relationship to all things around them changes the more that that is known and the more uh, they trust in the presence and reality of God. The same is true for families struggling with it. And the more they are aware and conscious of the presence of God, the more they're able to be patient and thoughtful and kind and all the kind of stuff that's needed to be supportive of the family members in it. Um, the, the health, uh, all the healthcare um, nurses, especially, I mean, there's so many ways that um, that, that, that you can name all the ways God is present and uh, in the situation. And if we wanted to do the statistical analysis, that we know that individuals who are getting, yes, the best medical treatment and such, but are in a community of love and care, and they recognize a presence and purpose outside the death sentence that they're wrestling with uh, are more likely to thrive, right? So, the, the there's like it, some people experience it's like either God's in complete control and took the person or saved the person or you know there's no God and I think the process vision is uh, another option and yeah it, which, which Tom yes does connect to one of the other questions on here <laughs> all right actually uh, while you're oh. uh, I, I've got an idea okay well then you I tell actually. Me- I actually wrote a chapter on prayer and how it might work in terms of the various factors and stuff. And I realized I've got like a little link that um, I'm giving away a free version, a free version of that chapter. So I'm going to find it real quick and paste it in the zoom chat and, but go ahead and ask me your question while you're, Oh, well, I mean, if you're, Look at this, Tom kind of starts handing things out, which yes, if, um, if, if y'all want to have a lot of fun, and come to Theology Beer Camp in October in ah. Chapel Hill. Uh, Tom will give you a, he, he has a book going in the swag bag. 
the introduction to open relational theology. And yeah. if you use the code ORT, O-R-T, you get $50 off your ticket to Theology Beer Camp, where one night, Tom, you don't even know this yet. No. Full Tilt Brewing Company, not that I don't think you keep up with cool craft breweries, <laughs> but Full Tilt Brewing Company is brewing a beer for Theology Beer Camp called Hashtag Process Party, and it's going to have in the can. It's going to have a sweet picture of Whitehead at a disco party on it. <laughs> and we will have said beer uh, during late night process party soiree at the Algae Beer Camp. <laughs> Use the code or at $50 off. You get Tom's book for free. <laughs> there you go. This is going to be a different book, though, once I find the link. But why don't you go wow. ahead and ask your question, and I'll find this link okay. all later. Bo on. has a question. He says, I understand you believe that process theology is better or more true than, say, reform theology. And I say, Bo, you're correct. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm thinking. That's why you're offering these podcasts. When I hear you and John Cobb talk about a process approach to religious plurality, it seems that process thinking does not allow for you to think that process theology is better than any other theology, just as Christianity is not better or more true than other faith traditions. It may be more true for you as a Christian, but not more true for a Buddhist. But Whereas you and John seem to believe this about Christianity, you most definitely do not believe this about process theology. Can you help me understand this contradiction or inconsistency? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I really like this question. Um, so I would put it this way. Um, process theology thinks about all of reality and tries to make sense of its various dimensions. And in that process, notices that um, other religious traditions, like the major ones, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, etc., um, notices that sometimes what is most important in those other traditions is uh, not very emphasized in most Christianity, most of Christianity. So take Buddhism and its emphasis upon the flow of reality. Most Christian tr traditions haven't talked much about that. Um, and so... Um, what process that wants to do is to say, hey, these other religious traditions, even those who don't have any God in them, can give us insights about the nature of existence, and they're valuable, and we want to embrace that. Uh, at the same time, process theology is saying there are better and worse ways to think about the flow of existence, or God, or freedom, or whatever. So within those particular big frameworks, thinking about flow or God, there are better and worse ways to think about those. And, and process theologians think that they have a better way to think about, let's say, God's love than uh, John Calvin's theology. So I would say uh, process theology is trying to find truth wherever it's at and is not afraid to identify positive things in religions outside of Christianity that they want to embrace and somehow try to enfold in process thinking, while at the same time not thinking that any old religion or any old even Christian denomin or Christian uh, theological tradition is as good as another. There, there can be better or worse uh, in the details while embracing some of the big ideas uh, you find in various traditions. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that there's a um, okay. One, I, I, sometimes I have a hard time deciding if I should always say what I'm really thinking. <laughs> you no, know, Tom, you're nice, and since this is just between me and you and the Christian Process Group, um, like I think there are scales of of quality when it goes okay. to depictions of uh, big pictures, big picture thinking um, in, in uh, like, why are you talking? I thought, of, I, I think there are different touchstones and right. And so mm -hmm. you have to include them. It doesn't mean there's only one picture, right? That fits them all, but um, the, the four different ones, this is specifically, I think, if because the reference at first was like reform theology like if i was yeah. a christian theologian i think a uh, a theological rich theological vision one touchstone is going to be reality the best account of reality that we have right so 
um, there are limits. <laughs> uh, there are a host of theologies to get eliminated when you understand contemporary science and um, all these kinds of things. Uh, and, and I think of all the big rich metaphysical pictures that have been developed in the last hundred years uh, it, after um, relativity, all these kinds of things, um, process is one of the most complete, compatible, and compelling visions of engaging a thick, rich account of the world as we know it best through the scientific disciplines. Second touchstone, experience. Does the, does the picture of the world cohere with the experience of being human? Uh, phenomenology is a great tool if you're a philosopher working this out. I think process phenomenology is its most compelling part uh, to me. And, uh, but not all accounts given equally uh, include an equally compelling account of phenomenology. Right. Um, just think if you were a reformed theologian, um, uh, how little impact and shaping our phenomenological experience of the world gives to anything. Anyway, then if you're a Christian <laughs> theologian, you may want to ask, like, I don't know, they'll know we're Christians by our love. What is the beautiful lives that are shaped if this vision is embodied and lived out? Um, earlier this week, I had a little Twitter exchange and some reform people got really upset that someone quote tweeted me being snarky on a podcast that said, I'd rather be an atheist than a Calvinist. And I was just being honest, but that's because Calvin uh, burned someone for a theological disagreement. I don't think that's cool. I don't think it <laughs> demonstrates character and formation that I want to emulate. And I don't think, anyway, do you see what I'm saying? Yep, um, yep. I'm not saying if I was in that time, I would be significantly different. I'm just saying that account of the world should be clearly wrong at this one. And the, the fourth one, so you got reality, got experience, phenomenology. You got like beauty, loved, and what is expressed. And that fourth one's Jesus. If you're a Christian, then God should at least be as nice as Jesus. Your theology should be like, oh, I can see what inspired this. And if there's some basic tenets that a lot of other theologians think are essential that drive me up a wall, if it doesn't include responsibility related to freedom and agency, it doesn't seem to cohere with the Hebrew scriptures or the Christian testimony. Preach it, brother. Preach if it. it, doesn't it. If, it, if it includes God choosing to create people that bear the divine image for eternal conscious torment, and that somehow demonstrates holy love. It's bullshit. It's wrong, and it's bad theology. It just it. Be here, so, here. Like there's a whole host of things that are just dumb. If you want to be Christian, <laughs> I don't think they're good. They're just wrong. They're not beautiful. They're not compelling. Like anyway, so I, I, I don't. That doesn't mean that there aren't really creative ways of reworking the reform tradition. I think Douglas Otati gives one of the most beautiful and compelling ways. What you do is you let Schleiermacher and Bart fix all the rough edges. So the things that were really important for it before. Yeah. It, and so I don't, I, I don't want the, so I don't normally say all those things, but that's what goes to my mind. Like, I just like, it's not a live option to me there. Yeah. If, that's if a live conversation like you know, for you, when you're thinking theologically, is like, well, you know, I would care what a cognitive scientist has to say about this, but I read this passage in First Thessalonians, interpreted it literally, and so it demands me to ignore it. I don't know what to do with that. Anyway, sorry. It's one of the things I like about you, Trip. You know, you and I, we both function, we both operate in various realms or worlds, one of the worlds we operate in is the academy in which um, it, it is expected. You're supposed to keep your cards close to your chest and not really tell anybody your personal thoughts about things. <laughs> but I like you because you come out. I mean, you can do that in certain situations, certain podcasts. I know you're asking questions and you're, I know what you're really thinking. <laughs> but I like it when you just come out and say, you know, this, this is bullshit. <laughs> uh, this, this just makes, makes me happy. Well, I, and I think it's important to see. Do you, okay, so because you and I have the positions we have, um, public ones that talk about God a lot and some of the issues process people care about, like science and religion or the problem yep. of evil and suffering, these kinds of things, the moment you articulate a different picture, you know, one where, I don't know, God as revealed in Jesus Christ somehow 
is seemingly connected deeply to the picture of God, then you get people that grew up in these contexts, right? You know, most of the people in the Reformed churches, they don't, they don't, they don't read Schleiermacher. They didn't know like these creative ways of dealing with the Reformed tradition, blah, 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 blah. No, they just were like singing Isaac Watt hymns and thinking they suck. So <laughs> I, I, anyway, I don't, so I, I don't, I don't always, uh, one of the reasons I really liked, um, like doing this class. And when I said, John, like, what are the six topics in process thought? Like, if you were introducing, you think are important. Those are the ones that animate him. They were different than the six I would pick. Like, yeah. and, uh, but, and there are multiplicity of Christian expressions of process. Which Joe oh, Bracken definitely. is very definitely. different than anyway, than, yes. you know, all the ones that are there. But I do I think that the, that if you're assessing them, there has to be some touchstone thing. The, our friend Dan Koch, uh, who runs You Have Permission podcast, who will be at yep. Theology Beer Camp with us. Oh, good. Oh, excellent. Um, w- you, a couple months ago, interviewed our mutual friend, Oliver Crisp, Reformed theologian. He's been I on Homebrewed as well. Yeah. Right. And they were talking about depravity. And, you know, it, if you were going to be Reformed, I joke when he was on the podcast, you should keep it crispy. Like do it Oliver Crisp yeah, style because exactly. it's like he's technically reformed and he does all these detailed now write books and articles on all of it. It's just he comes up with unique ways within that language game of a tradition to like dodge. Yep. They get central tenets. You know, it would. Yeah. It, I fit and I asked him this, so this isn't like speaking up turn. I was like, it seems to me sometimes like you nuance, dodge, and rework a tradition in ways that. Like, why wouldn't you just start somewhere else? You know? Yeah. It would be like you talking, you're like trip. Oh, like you like whitehead. And you're like, yeah, but um, you just have to understand, like, it's not really all in process. It's more like, like there are some relations Yeah. and some of them are important, but you, and you just start like stepping back from what you seem to be, what drove anyway. I don't know. Right, what to do I, got with a that. Qu- I don't either, but I like Oliver and he does. Yeah, I do. So I, I, that's why I interviewed him on the podcast about as attractive as it can be. (laughs) Yes. Did you Um, realize that he did a law degree the last three years for kicks and giggles? No, I didn't know that. He's like the main, one of the main theologians at St. Andrews and did a law degree as his side gig while he still published three books. (laughs) So impressive guy. Okay. I got a question from, for you comes from Brandon. If the world gives rise to God as much as God gives rise to the world, then would it be accurate to say that prior to the existence of the universe, God was not? Wouldn't whatever, whoever contained the potentiality of all that is prior to creation be God? Am I totally misunderstanding the process perspective on creation? What do you think, Tripp? Well, Tom, I feel like you edited a book of a bunch of (laughs) open relational theologians with different opinions on this question. Yes. um, uh, And there are different ones just in the special guests that were here. So uh, I'll give two answers and you can tell me if I should, if we should add more. Okay. Okay. So if I was Joe Bracken and I'm a, you know, a a Jesuit theologian and I asked this question uh, and and it, it, I never know how much when I start talking process with someone, people don't pick up if they haven't done it for a long time. So this might yeah. help, um, you know, for, for Bracken, he wants to say something like, um, God's decision to create another is one in which the infinite field of the divine life or the divine matrix, uh, 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 multiplies its centers, right? Like uh, entities. Uh, and, and so there are now more activity within the infinite divine matrix. Um, and in each entity within it has its own identity. Uh, but prior to creation, the divine uh, matrix, the Trinity for him uh, was all there is. Um, but then the dignity of entities is given. And so let's say this kind of question comes up. He would say something like, 
Um, he goes, he's affirming creation out of nothing. God's free loving decision to choose to create is one in which uh, the, the uh, relational matrix of God is now shared with others. Right. And the, the other has certain relational demands, dignity, freedom, love, and care. And the others cultivate over time. And so brand, so the, the world, God world relationship comes into being because the ultimate eternal other chooses to have another other. And then right. basically the process framework goes in. Uh, I think the orthodox <laughs> process answer is God and the world are an everlasting relation. Right. Um, this was a very live option in the early church. It became uh, uh, kicked out. <laughs> As, as a live option over time for uh, heresy reasons, mostly because a number of Gnostics articulated it because they picked it up from Plato. Um, but, you know, picking up from Plato didn't stop the Cappadocians from borrowing his uh, language for coming up with the Trinity. So it's not like, you know, a, a necessarily bad thing. But for Whitehead thought God and the world are co-eternal. So God and the world are co-eternal because uh, creativity, that which is all things and is nothing in particular uh, holds them both. And so the God world relationship is this ongoing dynamic encounter for us in our particular space time, our cosmology, like if you think the major cosmological picture, 13.8 billion years ago, uh, fluctuation in a vacuum, all of a sudden you get the stability of uh, like the, in the quantum order and you get the physical world emerging and chemistry and all these things over time, there's a couple of dead star cycles and such, and then life and all these kinds of things. You take that picture, if you are thinking process and such, the, what is called the cosmological constants and uh, kind of, if you're thinking about the anthropic principle and these kinds of things, uh, those are this particular space time dependent. And so like they come into being um, in the God world relationship in this particular space time, but there's obviously ones before. Uh, and once they become habits, they're generative habits and God uses those to lure, create more complexity uh, over time. They're, those are, those are cosmological, this space time uh, sets for process people that think that there's a multiplicity of universes or cycles and all that kind of stuff. There are metaphysical constants and those are I think what Brandon was getting at, that God and the world are always entangled. They don't yeah. always have the same cosmological constants that you get for our universe. Um, and yep. uh, in, in, I think the shortest explanation of the, that picture is in David Ray Griffin's most recent panentheism book, the chapter on cosmology in it. It was, it's really great. But, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, I think David's done some really good work there. I don't have anything to add. I think you you uh, outlined the two basic options in open relational thought and most process people go with the latter one and most self-identifying open theists go with the Bracken one you uh, the one you identified with Bracken why well, I just said him since he was on but yeah there's yeah, yeah. you know there's others Clayton um, Phil Clayton would be in that group John Sanders would be in that group yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it, it, if you people are interested at some point Phil and I did a podcast back in the day called processing your doctrine. And it half of it turned into him and I arguing about this. So <laughs> he and I also argue about this. <laughs> <laughs> you know. All right. Um, okay. Tom, here's another one that I think would be good as uh, the most networked uh, process. Thank you. Oh, um, uh. M uh, asks, I'd love to be pointed toward uh, BIPOC mm -hmm. process thinkers. Would love some reading, listening around the intersection of process and liberation theologies. Then there are others that said, oh, what about feminists too? Yes, yes, yes. Um, the, it, it, like, are there particular places you would send people or, or thinkers when trying yeah. to look at uh, a process beyond, uh, you know, a more Eurocentric or Anglo-centric uh, expression? Yeah. You help me with this too, because you, you're very networked as well. But the, the, the people that come quickly to mind are Monica Coleman and her work, uh, including a womanist theology book she wrote. What's the name of that book? Making a Way Out of No Way. That's it. Making a Way. Yep. 
Uh, Karen Baker Fletcher also wa- uh, wrote a womanist book. A womanism, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like uh, the black uh, or African uh, version of feminism, its own distinctive issues and things. Anyway, um, Karen Baker Fletcher wrote a book called Dancing with the Trinity. Theo Walker, a uh, black uh, philosopher, philo- philosophical theologian, has done some interesting work what's his spaceship one there starship what's mothership that? mothership mothership there we go <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh monica's been on the podcast a bunch of times uh yes she was on great she's very articulate committee. yeah um we oh, did a oh, yeah cool we did a uh um we did a session in the first class we did together on karen baker fletcher and theodore walker was on uh was during the last class i did with adam uh adam clark on upsetting the powers the legacy of james cone and oh. we did one on cone and process thought and theodore walker was our uh special guest and then nice. we did a second special session on black process philosophy not just in religion nice um, and uh, so, so anyway you, people that are, you know if you're one to listen or watch you can go check those out yeah how about uh, asian uh, i think of andrew sung park come quickly mm-hmm. to mind um, who are some others that come to your mind when you think of? Well, I think the Japanese, the Korean. Uh, um, what was Chinese. what was the book? Uh, we had this big conference on process and liberation when I was at when I was at Claremont. Hmm. Um, I've if the boxes behind me were emptied, which are <laughs> all my books, then I could turn around and look. Um, I'm reaching for a book myself. This is a feminist the, book. You know the the one that. Uh, Helen Russell and Monica Coleman edited together. I, oh, <laughs> it was right behind me. I thought I should put that one up. This is a fantastic book because it's not only giving you some really excellent representative feminist voices, but there's kind of a dialogue going in on in the book itself from uh, folks responding to that. So I strongly recommend this one. Yeah. And, and, and people, you know, on here, if you, you met um, Catherine Keller uh, and Jacob Erickson, who if you start to Google them and find out what they're in, like Jacob, for example, has been a part of, uh, um, also publishes in, in the, what's the series they do at Drew? The um, interdisciplinary theology series. Yeah. Oh man. It, it's it's like interdisciplinary were. theology. Anyway, Catherine has been an editor in the whole series, but each of the, events that turn into these edited volumes are on kind of specific places that kind of post-structural thought and process make connections in some way and uh and they're very helpful um the uh yeah so the the other things in feminist thought rosemary radford ruther who passed recently um uh sally mcfay um marjorie suhaki i was um, just thinking that if people russell People wanted to go to the Center for Open and Relational Theology, which is C, the number four, ORT.com. If you go to the voices page, you can see just a long list of over 100 people, including um, people of color, fem- uh, feminists, etc. cetera. So that would be a, a good place to go if you're, if you're interested. And in fact, if anybody is a part of this uh, session who identifies as open relational process and would like to add their name to the uh, voices page, um, send me a private note or contact me in social media or something. Yeah. All right. Um, now, is it my turn to ask a question? Uh, I, think so. I think, no, no, no. You ask me, you ask me that one. Cause that was oh, okay. about, uh, good. Cause, cause you... I haven't looked ahead. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Oh, Betty. Going back to Betty again. She had several. If there's a lure toward good trip, is there also a lure lure toward evil? Is there a pull toward aggression, hostility, destruction? Cruelty seems more than just an absence of a good lure, unless the human is intrinsically cruel. So where does that come from? Okay, I think that's a I think it's a great question for two reasons. One, uh, Whitehead's account of evil is much more robust than a privation account. Um, and I think there's a wonderful 
five page summary of Whitehead's account of evil in my book, Divine Self Investment. I spent quite a bit of time <laughs> trying to write it uh, clearly and in a short way with lots of references to the places he talks about it. And the most he talks about it outside of these little bits is in uh, Religion in the Making when he's looking at the changing shape of consciousness in human history. Uh, anyway, so the other thing I would say is that when all things are brought into God, then it changes the notion of evil. So evil primarily, uh, especially in popular sense, it seemed like a violation of some demand of God. But when God experiences each thing, uh, then thinking about evil, suffering, these kinds of things takes a different tone um, because it becomes much more a way of thinking about uh, the, not so much the privation of good, uh, but the eternality of an event uh, of harm and act against the well-being of the network or web of life uh, that one's in uh, the so yeah the the uh, but the question of lure I think is important so the lure uh, metaphysically is a, a way of describing and I know some people prefer the word call or, or whatever but it is God's valuation of the available possibilities in the next moment of becoming. So um, the past, every moment is one of the three centers of power, you could say. Um, you can't change the past, it's inherited, it comes there. And then knowing where the past is, I like to think of it like a pizza slice. Uh, so like the past, in the last moments there, it's already an actual, it's compressed, it's now existing. So from there, you got like a pizza slice, kind of up and down, you got the crust, spectrum of crust. And that's possible. Now, if you ask like, what, what would God want in a vacuum? Oh, maybe like eschatological bliss and eternal love dance and all that kind of stuff, but not available <laughs> given what just happened, because the next moment is receiving the world that just happened into it. And so mm -hmm. you have this spectrum. And so the lure is to like, what is the most zesty, beautiful, good thing right here? What does justice look like? What embodied in this next moment? Right. And then whatever happens, you know, it, it concresses. And now that's the next moment. So depending on that spectrum of possibility, where it concresses, now the, you have the new pizza, pizza slice of crust of possibility. So the lure is... God going, this top of the crust, more beautiful thing, is preferred over bottom of the crust, ugly thing. So, like, uh, God doesn't desire for me to just start cursing at Tom, saying horrible things, and gossiping about people on this. But if I did, that would have already happened. I can't go back in time and change it. <laughs> so then I'd have to figure out what to do with it, right? So um, the lure is not a lure towards evil or good. It is always... Uh, you know, Paul uses the line that um, uh, no, you can't escape the love of God, even, you know, goes through, goes through that whole litany. Uh, even if you go all the way down to Sheol, the love of God in Christ Jesus comes. The lure comes no matter where you are and then gives the gift of possibility. So the lure is always towards um, the most, uh, the most beautiful possibility in the next moment. Mm. Now, evil is the pull of the past towards the degradation of value. It's something we inherit, and there are lots of ways you inherit it. Uh, you inherit it uh, because you've internalized habits and understandings that blind you or close you off to possibilities that God can see. You inherit it because you participate in systems, structures, and institutions that bring with it valuations and blindness towards injustice and corruption and these kinds of things. Like you, 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 there's a whole host of ways this happens. And another way is the, the, the kind of third big inheritance is that um, we are creatures with a long biological inheritance with all sorts of drives, limitations, and or and organs in the way we see the world. There's so many ways, but I think our biological inheritance, our social, cultural, uh, institutional inheritance, and our own habits, past, and previous decisions. Those are all the ways that come into a moment where perversity, evil, destruction, these kinds of things end up having power. But they don't come from the gift of possibility. They come from the inheritance of the past. But the inheritance of the past in each moment. Uh, does limit the horizon 
of the crest of the possible. And so like evil it. is not the gift from God, but evil is our, uh, in some sense, the reception of what we've been given. And if you were going to put it in a pithy statement, you'd say something like um, the evil is visited upon generation to generation. You see what I mean? Like uh, uh, yeah. it, it comes in. So, all right, uh, I got okay. it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I want to no, weigh no, no. in. I was about I, to start preaching, Tom. You got to cut me off. <laughs> I agree with everything. This is you our said. new record for most questions. I know we're doing well tonight, aren't we? I don't we? know what to do about this. <laughs> I agree with everything you said. I want to answer it in a different kind of way. I want to ask the question, is there room for the devil in process theology? And I'll try to answer my own question. I don't know that there's room for a devil if the devil is an omnipresent being who's intrinsically evil, always necessarily and eternally luring reality creatures, et cetera, toward evil. Whitehead, to my knowledge, doesn't believe in that kind of a devil. Hartshorn doesn't. I, don't, I can't think of any process thinker who believes there's an ontological being who's omnipresent, who's intrinsically evil and has no capacity for goodness. I don't think that's anyone believes that. Now, I think you might be able to insert that, but you might not have processed theology anymore. (laughs) But um, there's two aspects, I think, of process thought that can talk about evil. One, personified evil, and the other, evil systems. Let's talk about the personification, because at least some process folks think there's the possibility of life after death, subject, continued subjective experience beyond the death of the body. And because that life after death could, those, those, uh, that experience might be influencing the present realm or this world or whatever, And because those who go into that state don't instantaneously, or at least we don't think, will instantaneously become perfectly good, I think there's room and process thought for something like the demonic in terms of actual entities who are like, I don't know, Casper the unfriendly ghost or something like that. (laughs) How's this for getting wild? So I think there's actually room in a process metaphysics for something like demons. But most process folks, when they talk about evil, they'll talk more with the language you mentioned, and they'll bring up questions about systems of evil, principalities and power. And this is, you, were, you were expressing that in a more technical language. Um, so what do you think of that, trip? What do you think about the devil and demons from a process perspective? Um, well, I, I've never been in a part of the church that was ever worried about invisible demonic agents i mean i had a friend give me um that frank peretti book in high school hey i read that piercing the darkness i think it was called yeah so i read that baby there was a a couple weeks one summer on vacation in middle school where i was super creeped out and then i (laughs) told my dad about it while driving back from texas and he's like what yeah he's like is this a fiction book i was like yeah but you know it's based on the bible and he was like Ah, uh, and that led to a fun conversation, but um, but I would there's this uh, um, uh, there's this these three lectures that uh David Ray Griffin gave at a uh, Lexington mm. Theological Seminary on uh the demonic in a postmodern world, I thought were rather brilliant. It's basically a process, it, process theology engaging Walter Winks, kind of yes, yeah, upsetting the powers that that whole his trilogy on the powers. Uh, which I thought was really good. Um, there's one bit, and I, you tell me if this sounds right, because I didn't know we were going to talk about this, so I can't remember it exactly. But uh, in A Fall to Violence, Marjorie Suhaki's book on evil, which is one of the most influential books I've ever read, and I think it's great. Great book, um, yeah. It, it, she, talk, she has this riff in it um, about the way anxiety breeds evil. Now, and she's dealing with uh, Paul Tillich. So Paul Tillich, a 20th century theologian, thought that um, what gets expressed as 
cult, the demonic in culture is ultimately driven by our fear of death, finitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing we are going to eventually suffer and die generates an ontic shock. This is Paul Tillich. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we create all sorts of safeties, <laughs> as many as we can. Fantasies to distract us, structures to protect us. And what do structures do? They distance us from the violence uh, that's demanded for our protection. So uh, a good example, like um, uh, most of us are unaware unless until you watch the right documentary about the kind of death, destruction, and suffering that's entailed in the production of most of our clothing and food. Uh, and then you see it and you're like, oh, junk, but you were connected to it all the time. Hmm. Um and what we want to protect ourselves, we want to have these things. So we, we create these structures that give it to us. Now, Marjorie says, yes, there, there is a kind of ontological shock, but the primary feature isn't that death. The primary feature is that we are actually all connected. And so despite the fact that we are blind to our connections, we are connected. And so a lot of the angst, a lot of the anxiousness, insecurity uh, that generates the isms that we think of uh, that become expressed in systems and institutions uh, through, through violence and harm, um, that, that ultimately uh, the, the pain of being a human uh, that, that, that we're haunted by isn't just our finitude. It's the way in which we've blinded ourselves and protected ourselves uh, from recognizing the, the actual harm uh, uh, that we generate. And I found that, to, I, I mean, it's, I love existentialism, so it's not hard for me to get excited about <laughs> ontic shock. Yeah, uh, I'm notorious for telling infants when they start screaming, don't worry, ontic shock gets easier when you get older. <laughs> uh, but I think Marjorie's point is, is really helpful. That if you take seriously yeah, like the it. way we're connected, then there are lots of ways um, we, we're, we're woven into a web of life and that we are agents of violence and harm without knowing it. Yep. And what happens when you're cutting yourself off from life? That's beautiful. Excellent. Got nothing right. more to add to that one. Look, I, I couldn't, I, that's what I kind of, I remember it was Paul Tillich and Niebuhr she was arguing with and, yeah. um, but, but I promise the book version is better. So everyone <laughs> should go read the fall to violence. If you read the whole thing and don't like it, tell me, you can mail me the copy and I'll pay you for it. All right. <laughs> um, okay. Tom, two things. One, uh, I have a kid that's about to go to sleep. And I'm going to go give him a kiss while you start to answer this question. Okay. But the second part is, and this is me, this is a good one. We had two different questions on the Trinity. Oh my. And um, now uh, what, what I need from you, what are three different ways a process person could respond to the doctrine? Like, like what are a multiple, what give us the palette the palette oh, man I, I there's there's multiple there more than three you can give i know you can give how many ever you want but it was a joke okay. because it's the trinity you get it got give it three it took me a second but, yeah yeah well that, maybe that's revealing tom <laughs> <laughs> all right but, uh, I'll, I'll give three responses to the trinity from a process or open relational perspective I think uh, those in the community who have a really strong appreciation for uh, the Trinity tend to go to embrace what in theological circles we call the social Trinity. It's the version of the Trinity most common in Eastern circles, Eastern Orthodoxy. It's a version that tends to emphasize God as three persons, triune, you know, one God, three persons. And the reason that's attractive to many in the open relational process community is that um, that way of thinking about God as three persons who are interrelated really stresses the relationality inherent in God and this kind of giving and receiving within the Godhead. And that then mirrors nicely on relationality in creation, that there's a, uh, not only a relationality amongst creatures, but a real relationship with God and creation. 
So people in the process community who are social Trinitarians, um, people like Joe Bracken, Philip Clayton, um, um, uh, bu, 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 we just mentioned her a second ago. Why am I blanking? Oh, uh, Karen Baker Fletcher. Those people um, will talk an awful lot about how what we see in creation is mirrored in God, or, or better, God is mirrored in creation and the interrelationality. And they will emphasize that this relationality also speaks to the essence of God as a loving God, because God has lovingly been giving and receiving eternally uh, to the benefit of God and the God self. And you can affirm creation out of nothing and have the social trinity, or you can reject it, but um, that's a, a real vibrant stream within process, open relational thought, thinking about the trinity. A second stream within process thought rejects the trinity, just says that doesn't make any sense, at least uh, the social trinity and the typical Christian versions of it. So you've got Unitarians who are process or at least open relational, people like uh, Lewis Ford, who's uh, deceased now, or um, um, uh, who does the Trinity's podcast, uh, Dale Tuggy, a more a biblical Unitarian. Uh, and these people often point out the problems with thinking that somehow God can be three persons and with one unity. And there's all kinds of details. If you're really interested in that, I do recommend Dale Tuggy's um, podcast on the Trinity because he uh, gives a very articulate defense of Unitarian doctrine and um, critiques major uh, heavy hitters in Trinitarian theology. So some folks in the process tradition just reject the Trinity. A third option, and here I think I'll use Keith Ward, although I think John Cobb is similar here as well, but I'll use Keith Ward because he's articulated it fairly recently. His version of the Trinity is more like there's one God with varying expressions, or it's sometimes called modalism or Arianism, although there's all kinds of details and and Keith thinks he evades uh, the traditional uh, modalism and Arianism. But the basic point is you've got one God who's a spirit who's manifest in various ways um, in creation as, you know, maybe creator, savior, and redeemer, or there's a lot of different ways you can talk about it. But in that way of thinking, uh, it's more of a Unitarian kind of approach, but thinking about God in this dynamism and revealed in particular ways over time. Um, there's an interesting book came out 20 years ago or so that kind of lays out a variety of options. Uh, people in it from Bracken, Suhaki, Greg Boyd, David Griffin, et, et cetera, laying out their particular ways of thinking about the Trinity, some of them social Trinita Trinitarians, others non-Trinitarians. If I remember right, um, David Griffin's Trinity is like, a trinity of trinities. <laughs> I don't remember what the, the details are, but if you're interested in that book, it's an edited essay, an edited book called Trinity and Process. Um, so there you go, Trip. I laid out three options for folks. Well, I I that was great. Um, do you so which, which one ends up being more attractive to you? Like it, because I yeah. think depending on depending on what question you think as a theologian, the Trinity answers, then what it, what is demanded in a sense by the tradition varies, right? So like, what is, um, when the church came up with the Trinity, what was it trying to communicate and how do you communicate it in the present? Um, yeah. Varies, right? And I think part of the reason the Trinity has become uh, the, the Trinity became a doctrine in the later half of the 20th century that became so essential is uh, uh, I think this is true. You tell me if you do, this is another one okay. of trip sweeping judgments. He makes on the <laughs> inside. Doesn't always say, I think that um, when Protestantism gave up on doing metaphysics, it took a host of si ways of sidestepping metaphysical reflection. This is like thinking about how God really is in a real world doing real things. Yeah. So um, the first big dodge was Kant. Um, 
But in the 20th century, a large number that weren't liberal Protestants, they used the Lindbeck dodge. Yep. Uh, and so what does it mean to be a faithful Christian? It's the structure, the grammar of Christian ascent, right? Like, so Christian language is Trinitarian. And somehow, if you say Father, Son, and Spirit, that coheres with whatever was getting itself done when the Cappadocians came up with language of the Trinity. Yeah. Um, and, and they do the similar thing about uh, the Eucharist. And they're like, this is subverting empire. And you're like, I am not sure it works that way. But, um, <laughs> but, yeah. but I think underneath it is this anxiety, right? That does our theological language have traction in the world? And if it yeah. does, how does it? So the repetition of the of dogmatically internally consistent to the tradition language um, became a way of preserving whatever was at the heart of Christianity. And I think that in, in some sense, that sidesteps the very dis, the very reason the language of the Trinity emerged mm. uh, in the third and fourth century. They were trying to use the best philosophy at their time to articulate how. There's one good God of creation and that God that is invisible and is spirit and is love is expressed in the materiality of Jesus, a Jewish prophet who is executed and raised. Yep. And we come to participate in that very life. Participate so much the same mind is in us that is in Christ Jesus. Like all these kinds of things. And yep. how does that happen? Through the baptism of the spirit, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Like, so you could see how under Platonist metaphysics, the Trinity emerges as an expression of the actual experience of the God revealed in Christ in the churches mm. in, in, in the best, most articulate way they could in that time. To me, like the social Trinitarian move when process people do it yeah. is like giving a nod to the language counters <laughs> <laughs> and going like we're going to keep that around but yeah but if you're doing metaphysical thought like if you aren't you know muted by kant or wittgenstein or whatnot yeah. then i feel like it demands that you give an art a metaphysical articulation that is as coherent and compelling today as what the trinity actually was when it was developed or you um, can just do you could just be a radical orthodox person and say well, you, could do that. you just got to embrace that old metaphysics even though you and i aren't going to do that but i mean that's that move there yeah tom that's triggering yeah. <laughs> it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but do, do you think I that think, part I of think, it is that side like the like how do you preserve that expression when well, I think for some is it's a language thing. For some, it's look the Trinity's function as important part of the tradition. For, uh, I mean, it's not in the Bible, but it's it's functioned that way for seventeen hundred years or so, and we want to keep that. But I think for others, it's it's deeper than that. It's a metaphysical claim that is important. They want to say God's relational inherently, and they want to say God is everlastingly loving, and so a social Trinity can get that for them. Um, now, God, that God isn't essentially related to a world or isn't essentially loving a world. That's going to be a, quote, free gift after the world comes into to being. But I think it's a metaphysical, um, a, a metaphysical uh, impulse that some in the process and open relational community have for affirming the social trinity. Um, the problem with that, and they know this, is that that language sounds awfully tritheistic. And the more you have persons and the more they're really giving and exchanging, uh, giving and receiving and exchanging relationships, the more it just sounds like three. And um, almost everybody wants to avoid that tritheism. But so I look at it like this. I'm I'm, I don't have a lot at stake in the Trinitarian fights. <laughs> People will read my books and they'll say, well, where's the Trinity in there? And I'll say, you know, it doesn't function. At least the social Trinity doesn't function for me as an, like an essential category like it does for others. And the reason it doesn't is that I don't have creation out of nothing. So I don't have to have 
the social trinity to have a God who's everlastingly and essentially loving and relational because I got a God who's everlastingly creating and relating and loving the world. So I don't have to make that kind of metaphysical well, move. <laughs> well, Tom, you, I will say that um, in my experience, you have referenced the trinity more in every chapter of all your books than the entire Bible. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, you get to pick the last question. You get to pick the okay. last one. Good. The last. And I question. want you to know we've done so many questions, and we're only in an hour and twenty minutes since we actually yep. started. And this, but is, this last one I'm going to give you is a softball, and so oh, you're going to have to figure out how to. What's my favorite book yourself. on Christology? <laughs> it's kind of oh. like that. <laughs> okay. I would like to know how Trip sees the cross of Jesus. It's, I find it's the biggest reason I have to stay away from church, says Jocelyn. The talk of Jesus' blood, the Eucharist, the lamb taking away the sin of the world, the sacrifice. Those words make me squirm, and I'm not sure what to do with them. A reframing of the cross trip and those words would be so helpful. So give it to us. Oh, well, there is this amazing book called Divine self <laughs> and Chapter 5. I spend quite a bit of time on this. Anyway, um, and and uh, uh, if you were in the Lent class I did with Diana Butler Bass, I did a, a much longer talk on this. But um, the, the there are two things I would say. Underneath the ugly interpretations of the cross are a set of assumptions that are sub-Christian. One of them, that God the Father, and we're using the language that's often used there, is somehow uh, uh, in a violent conflict with God's best son. If your account of the cross is one where God, God's character is in contrast with the character of the one we call the image of the invisible God, then it's, that's problematic. If you, if the, if, if Jesus told us to love our enemies pray for those that persecute us, turn the other cheek, and God is like, I, never mind. Then there's problems, right? The, underneath so many of the ugly versions of the atonement is an assumption that divine perfection demands creaturely suffering and annihilation. Mm -hmm. And I think that this isn't just true about process thought. I think it's at the very heart of the witness of the people of Israel and the early church is that the identity of God is the one who's chosen to not be God without us. And that God is deeply invested and, and entangled in our relationships. And so then you have to go, well, then what do we do with these languages? So the, the image that you get of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The one image is God in creation is hanging out and is like, you know what? I think I'm going to create something. And you know what would be cool? Let me create something that, that will break the whole system, get me really pissed. I might drown all living things for a minute. And then I'm going to create a covenant after the Babel thing. And then eventually I'm going to start asking them to kill stuff. And then after that, I'll kill my kid. But whoa. I will sneak in at least 20% of the people through that. You know, like underneath that is it, 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 the, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world is a picture where the character of that deity is problematic. Another way of describing it is someone that has encountered God in Christ. And they, uh, I don't want to go through the, all the language here. Um, this is a whole section. Uh, that is not in the book. But if you look at the language of sacrifice in the New Testament, Paul picks it up and does the sacrifice in reverse. Uh, and that means that it's not the human that brings a sacrifice to atone self. It's God that gives the sacrifice to right God's self with the world. And uh, th this, is, this isn't just me made this up. Plenty of New Testament scholars have pointed out. Theologians like Eberhard Jungel and stuff pointed this out, but the inverse direction means that the lamb slain before that foundation of the world is a statement that God will give God's self to the world despite its rejection. And you say, Trip, where does that come from? In the very, in the in the in the prologue of John, 
the, the word came to his own and they knew him not. And then what? The word keeps coming until it is finished. How is it finished in the gospel of John? When the sun is lifted up, when he's on the cross is where the word is fully expressed. What word is expressed? It is the God from all creation. The word that was with God and with God and before God and is God, right? Like what is the word of God expressed and finished its expression on the cross? It is God's word for those who knew God not and did what? Put him on a cross. That is then the cross becomes not the means by which the eternal decides to write, uh, to, let, like, to let the punishment out so you get right with God. The cross becomes the revelation of all the evil and sin that we bear and, and end up cutting ourselves off from the divine embrace, right? So the, the, there are these systems of shifts. Another uh, element about the cross is the cross then becomes an event of solidarity. The cross reveals how God is present to, with, and for us in the midst of suffering. The cross is a sign of God's deep solidarity with all those who bear crosses in the present. Third, the cross becomes a nightmare. This is something um, Douglas Otati, uh, I talked about, I mentioned him earlier as one of my uh, favorite reformed theologians. Um, he, he talked about the cross as a transferable nightmare. An example of it is Scrooge in the Christmas story. Um, you you get, uh, you know, Tiny Tim and company. And he's being a horrible, selfish, rich prick. And then he's haunted by the ghost of Christmas past. Look at all the death you've dealt in your life. The ghost of Christmas present. Look what you're doing, Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas future. Do you want to live a selfish, inward life and die a lonely man with nothing left? And then at the end of the three hauntings, he falls in his grave and he rises to new life and changes the way he relates. Now, if you're a process theologian, then the three powers, past, present, and future, beautiful way of depicting it. And what else? What does the cross do? It gives us the hauntings that are appropriate. It reveals to us the way we have exercised agency and power in a destructive way. It reveals to us in the present the way we are entangled in system structures and in relationships of perversity. And it shows us what happens if we don't rise to a new life and participate in a new way of being in the world. The cross gives us the right nightmares. And the wrong nightmare is one where you don't know if you're loved and cared for. That is the wrong nightmare. If you don't know if God knows you, loves you, and cares for you, wrong nightmare. It's the wrong religion. That's so so the, the, the cross, I think, has been so riddled because the one that put everyone there, that put Jesus there and put us there when we experience crosses metaphorically, it, it is a God who could be set against us and against our ends. Mm. The, the problem with so much of cross language, blood language, all these kinds of things is as if the suffering and violence is demanded by God, right. rather than an expression of our resistance to the desire and dream of God. Yeah. So, but there's a long version of it in the book. Yeah, that's nice. And there's 1400 episodes of the podcast, so you can hear whole episodes about it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You like it. But Tom, you said you've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about the cross. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, what you said was better than I could have put it. You're, you're quite eloquent. Um, I think one of the things you've also said in podcasts, you didn't say it just now that I find helpful is to say that, you know, God didn't put Jesus on the cross. God didn't predestine Jesus to be on the cross, but you know, the Romans and the people of his time killed Jesus. And that, to me, I think is a, a really important step for people to make that switch and an open relational process perspective, which doesn't have a God predestining things. God doesn't even foreknow everything from all eternity. That helps to get past the, the things so many people have taught that, you know, Jesus' death, his blood, his sacrifice was placed on you know, since, since the foundation of the world is interpreted as predestined from all eternity. So switching, oh, yeah, yeah. switching that around has been helpful to me and, and to others. You know, it's fascinating, right? Like 
the phrase lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. If you hear that as God predestined Jesus to suffer for you, then yeah, it sucks. I'm just like, yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> but isn't that the common way? I mean, that's the way I heard it growing up and still hear it. It's, uh, yeah, I, that's the interpretation. Most people give that. You know what, Tom? I feel like the best way to, to beat that out is if you preach a liturgical cycle three times. So you have to do all the verses. Like yeah. by the end, like you're just like, obviously, like, I feel like the process thing all works out. I've tried it year A, B and C in the liturgical calendar and have a lot of trouble. Um, it's like when I hear the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, in, in my, the homebrewed Christianity guide to Jesus, uh, there's someone else that mentioned like, oh, how do you deal with Calvin and Anselm? But in that book, I do Luther and Anselm, uh, yeah. but in the <clears throat> chapter four or five or whichever one that talks about them, I, I do my charitable reading of them. And because what I think, what I try to communicate is the animating energy of their thought rather than the finality of their framework. Um, yeah. In it, I, I talk about how Anselm is describing a God that's refused to be God without us, and that Luther uh, is, is insisting that the most true thing about you is your God's beloved. And those are things I learned from them once I came to understand their system and its context and its historical situation. And those are things like I fully affirm deeply. Uh, and when I say them, I have a very process interpretation right, <laughs> to right. them. But um, the well i think that's part of it too is what's going on in scripture like there's mm -hmm. quite a few new testament passages that can be interpreted as jesus knows he's gonna die he's going to the cross and he knows that because it's been predestined it's already foreknown it's laid out and he's just going through what's already been decided um but those same passages can be interpreted as Jesus is smart enough to see that when love shines brightly in the world, there are going to be forces of evil that want to snuff it out. And that doesn't have to be a predestining kind of interpretation. So um, how you, it's not just going through the lectionary. It's also interpreting that scripture as you go through that lectionary. Oh, uh, <laughs> Which, you know, you're always interpreting Tom. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> well, uh, okay. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, I loved it too. We still have questions. We'll get them next time we do big God questions. Uh, you can always send us more. Uh, this has been know, a ton I feel of fun. good about how many we did tonight. Mike. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to create expectations. That's true. You know, <laughs> you know, I was, I, people all join live. See, this is the thing. We don't normally do it live. Yeah. So then each question is each of us giving an answer and then deciding what we think about it, the other ones yeah. and then playing it out, followed by stories where I try to get Tom to say things he might be uncomfortable with or make a joke to see if, <laughs> if he'll laugh about it. You know, uh, this, we had a little pep in our step this time. Um, that's right. <laughs> but so for Thanks those for that, invitation, though, but, and you Thanks need to so. tell everyone you know, over your shoulder, if they're watching the video, um, okay. uh, Center for Open Relational Theology in, in Northwind and stuff like, uh, what's the best place uh, for people uh, that you, you, you know, connect with you online other than, hang out at theology beer camp in October yep. in Chapel Hill. Uh, and they use your code, the, the code ORT, O-R-T, open relational theology. Yeah, thanks. For they get $50 off. They should do that because you know what's Definitely. cool? Being at the release of the process party beer where Tom will need someone to drink the beer for him so he can keep the camp. That's right. I'll give my ticket to somebody. You show he's up. And <laughs> he's a preserve his witness. <laughs> I just, just as one of those moments, just to remind you, Tom, if before you die, even if I never tell anyone about it and you say trip one time, I just want to get really drunk and talk theology with someone. <laughs> I hope you ask me, but I won't even tell anyone. Like if it has already happened, I wouldn't have told anyone. See, I'm still pretending it hasn't Yeah, because well, it hasn't, but I'm just, this is the lure, the lure, it, Tom, the lure. Well, I'll, I guess I'll be the, uh, designated driver at theology beer camp oh, no. it's gonna be See, a lot of driving is, <laughs> we arrange these things oh do you okay good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no the, the the last thing homebrewed christianity needs is poor life decisions uh <laughs> made and plus it's at a lutheran church it's kind of part essential to contextual ministry the lutheran church i think yeah, that's right <laughs>
<laughs> it's like in a holiness in a holiness congregation. <laughs> no basket, but a Lutheran church. Yep. Well, you were asking me how people get in, t- in touch with me. If they want yes. to know about the uh, doctoral program, uh, go to northwestseminary.com or .org. I'm not sure which it is, but Northwest, North Wind, sorry, Seminary. Um, my personal website is my full name, Thomas J. Ord, J-A-Y-O-O-R-D.com. So those are good places, but I'm pretty active on uh, Twitter, Facebook. So those are good places too. And, and they definitely go to your website, sign up for his email uh, because Tom sends emails and yeah. lets you know, not just all the stuff he's doing and that kind of thing. Um, also sends you cool free stuff every so often. And the Center for Open Relational Theology sends notifications when there's like, uh, if you want to know all the broad tent of open relational people are doing, there's like, oh, here's events. There's books coming out from all these different places and uh, yep. there are conferences happening and this and that. Like it's the easiest way. Uh, the theology beer camp is being featured in the august edition so Ooh. Yeah. well in that case now i'm <laughs> even more glad i mentioned it um but yeah thank you all for hanging out uh it's been a blast thank you everyone for being part of the christian process group uh i want you all to know here that um the you definitely want to connect with the cobb institute who obviously john cobb was a part of the class but <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have some amazing cool they have regularly these little pop-up individual classes on different topics to go uh, you can check those out um jay mcdaniel who uh tom mentioned earlier uh as someone who is multi-religious buddhist and christian uh is uh one of the steering people along with richard who i think everyone met early on in the class um was a great community uh, tons of resources there uh and uh in Coming up later in the year, we're going to do a series. So if you have ideas or topics that you're like, what's the process take on X, Y, and Z? And they're like ones you want to do big topics on. Um, Some of my friends at the Center for Process Study and I are going to do a series called Process This. At least that's what we're calling it right now. Um, And uh, the goal is to do a mixture of like podcasts, but then seminar type thingy so like a podcast that comes out everyone knows about it oh you could read the article or chapters from this book blah 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 blah. and then if you if you register you can join and then to be like a more zoom thing a short thing with the author and then you can pop on and ask questions or submit them we're still figuring it out but my main thing is if you did this or the other process classes and stuff like what are the topics you'd love us to get a process person on and talk about don't put it in the chat because i'm going to turn it off in a minute but email it to me <laughs> <laughs> and uh we'll see but yeah uh, it'll be fun next class for homebrewed is two things one doing a jr tolkien class that I come out later this week because of the lord of the rings tv show <laughs> and and my second favorite text, uh, well, non-biblical text after process and reality is probably Lord of the Rings. Then um, September, Do I Stay Christian class I'm doing with Brian McLaren, where he comes out as a big fan of process theology. So, um, you know, Tom, he gives us shout outs. Yeah, that's what uh, somebody called me and, and mentioned that to me. But I, I'm going through that book. I'm preaching a seven week series using should I stay Christian first two weeks, actually this Sunday is the first thing. First two weeks are all the no's and second two weeks are yes. And third way. Anyway, that's a great book. I recommend it. Yeah. And um, if you go to do I stay Christian.com, well, you should make sure you post all the stuff in the group. I know you've put hints or send it to me so I can email it to people oh, okay. um, in the group, but uh, we made three Brian and I, made three videos part one part two part three of the book that are like 25 ish minutes that you could use for a book group or by yourself or whatever as you go through yeah. it and then in are september yeah if you go to do i stay christian.com oh really i i went there and didn't see it so i'll go you again. have to sign up and then you get an email that tells you uh, well i thought i did that too but maybe not well the i'll do it again i get 
It, Tom doesn't read my emails, but uh, <laughs> it's an automatic email that you'll get and you'll get the login to the do I stay Christian page as our three videos that walk through the book. And the goal is that in September on Sunday nights, uh, the four Sundays will be on for a couple hours and we'll do Q and a based on the three parts of the group. And then the other topics uh, based on what different groups and individuals that read the book did. And Brian's like all down for specific questions. So all the, uh, all the people in uh, this group should obviously ask process related questions just so I get to talk about process more with Brian. So anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway and he and Brian will be at theology beer camp. And um, it's a, you know, it's another reason to come. Cool. All righty. Thanks trip. It's been a blast. Thank you all for hanging out and uh, we'll see you again soon.